thank you. I'd like to talk about <coughs> cellular senescence, which uh, Carol introduced. It's a, it's, a, it was a, it's a phenotype that was first discovered in cultured cells in the late 1950s by Leonard Hayflick. And the idea is that cells, sort of uh, healthy, normal cells, have a proliferative lifespan, and they stop dividing at some point, and, they, they, and that, that growth arrest is permanent. And uh, early on, it was appreciated by cancer biologists, this was probably important in cancer, that if normal cells had a limited lifespan, then they wouldn't become malignant. And that's how cancer biologists like myself um, came, became interested in cellular senescence. And it turns out to be true that the most of the uh, genes that are very, very important in cellular senescence, like P53 and P16 and RB, these are also um, cardinal tumor suppressor genes. So, so that um, uh, is where cellular senescence came from. Uh, and it, as I said, it's a tumor suppressor mechanism. It really uh, exists to help damage cells not undergo malignant conversion. So if you think about it, you get a bad sunburn, your melanocyte becomes damaged, and uh, may have oncogenic stress that would drive it into a cancer, but that cell instead, on an almost daily basis, we can show, decides to undergo this tumor suppressor mechanism, and it just becomes an arrested cell that persists for, in some cases, decades or ever, or forever. And it's clear that uh, this is an important uh, way of tumor suppression. So an, an early experiment I did in my career was to make mice that really couldn't do cellular senescence. They got rid of P16 and P53, the two sort of archetypal mediators of this process. And those animals died sort of at eight weeks of age in mice. So a normal lifespan of a mouse is two years. So they're very, very tumor prone. So not getting cancer really is a criterion of successful aging. So you know, tumor suppression is something active that re required on a daily basis. You can also show that uh, evolution, uh, the comparative biology shows some fascinating results here that it turns out naked mole rats are very long lived rodent that in part do this and become tumor resistant by having a very vigilant uh, senescent system. They activate P16 to an extent that normal mammals or other mammals do not. And elephants were recently described to have 50 copies of P53, a, a big excess of this sort of senescence promoting mechanism that may contribute to their longevity despite large body mass. And so this relationship between senescence and cancer and aging uh, has sort of led to this thing that, 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 that um, many people started to talk about as this sort of senescence theory of aging, and it kind of goes like this. The senescence, uh, which can come about from telomere shortening or DNA damage or other kinds of stress that we don't understand very well, prevents cancer on a daily basis, and that's good. And it may actually have other important uh, roles in preventing proliferative pathophysiology. There, there may be a role, for example, of these, some of these same pro pathways in preventing atherosclerosis. But in any event, uh, on a daily basis, you prevent malignancy and maybe some other proliferative diseases through cellular senescence. But the, 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 the bad part about that is the, the, the accumulation of these senescent cells that occurs throughout life, uh, such cells become toxic in later life. And so the idea is you have a good thing up front, but then it leads to a toxicity later on. And, and certainly senescent cells, uh, one can use markers for senescence, and they uh, tremendously increase with aging. So one of the markers that's best studied is the expression of P16, uh, this uh, cell cycle inhibitor. And it's virtually undetectable in most cells of young people and it increases exponentially. It sort of doubles every decade, and by the time you're you know, 80, it's 16-fold higher, for example. So, um, and the senescent, senescent cells are thought to be bad for two reasons. One is they don't do what they used to do. So if, if they were, a, say you have a T cell, and its job is to fight tuberculosis by recognizing some mycobacterial antigen, if that T cell stops working because it can't divide, that loss of function makes the host susceptible to that disease, for example. And, and so the loss of function is thought to be an important component of why senescent cells are bad. They, they sort of fill up the niches and don't let good <laughs> proliferating cells divide, and they, they, they're sort of non-proliferative cells that, that hog the environment. But similarly, they're also thought to be bad because they're a veritable factory of cytokines. So they produce many, many things that are associated with inflammation. And we believe that this inflammaging aging business that's a common phenotype of older adults, that they have a sort of misregulation and chronic inflammatory state, really represents in part the accumulation of senescent cells throughout life. So senescent cells are bad both for a gain of function and a loss of function reason. So what's the evidence that senescence plays a role in human aging? And I think this is important to talk about. Uh, it comes from really two areas. One is a, a raft of human genome-wide uh, genome association studies. Uh, having the, G the GWAS genome-wide association studies haven't been so successful, to, in, in my reading at least, of identifying uh, genes that are associated with human longevity. But they've been very successful about identifying genes associated with chronic disease. And uh, if you, I think that, that experience was instructive in that uh, if you look for hot spots in the human genome where many different diseases are associated, is there a hot spot of sort of human health, if you will, 
th there are sort of two. So one is the MHC locus, which is associated with, on chromosome six, you know, 20 different diseases associated with autoimmunity and inflammation. But the other is the, the CDK and 2A locus, so the P16 locus on chromosome nine. And that locus in particular is associated with virtually every condition associated with human aging. So cancer, atherosclerosis, type two diabetes, glaucoma, et cetera, with maybe the possible exception of neurodegenerative disorders. So I think that tells you that uh, how an individual regulates its senescence machinery plays a large role in how it manifests the stresses of aging, whether one gets cancer or atherosclerosis, for example. Another important piece of evidence comes from urine studies where it's been possible to make mice that lack some feature of the senescence machinery in their cells or that have excess senescence in their cells. And such animals will dem demonstrate either impaired or enhanced function with aging, depending on how you sort of genetically engineer the mouse. So muscle stem cell function can be improved by getting rid of P16, a result that Hel Helen Blau has shown who's here. Uh, my lab has shown that uh, P16 loss in pancreatic beta cells can be beneficial towards their proliferation throughout life. But these things usually come at a cost, and the animal's more tumor prone. You know, so the good news is you don't get whatever that aging phenotype is, but the, the bad news is the animal often dies of cancer. So this trade-off between cancer and aging has been tricky. Uh, there are two important caveats, I think, to discuss about the senescence theory of aging. So the first is, as Carol alluded to, aging is very complicated. There are undoubtedly forms of aging and aging phenotypes that have nothing to do with senescence. My lab has spent a lot of time trying to relate graying with uh, melanocyte senescence, and we to date have probably spent four postdoc years on this, and it's stone cold, unpublishable negative data. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, you know, not every aging phenotype is related to senescence. There are things that, pro but I've stopped trying to predict which, and which, which are and which aren't. So, I used to give this talk where I would say that, you know, the one common phenotype that has nothing to do with senescence is probably. Depression in the elderly, it's so complicated, it's probably not a replicative phenotype of the brain. And then, lo and behold, a bunch of neural stem cell biologists are now suggesting that replicative, rep, you know, replication of hippocampal neurons is really important in depression in the elderly. So I, I quit, I give up. I, I don't think one can predict. But suffice it to say, there are gonna be, there are gonna be phenotypes that are age-related and, and others that aren't. Another important a caveat to the, the model is that the m markers of senescence in, in mammals are, are not great. So for a long time, senescence was thought to be an in vitro artifact. And it really wasn't appreciated to happen in, 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 in intact mammals, really, I'd say, until the last decade. But I think now it's, it, the markers are sufficient to allow to show that these cells accumulate and are demonstrable. But we still can't say, Mr. Smith, how many cells do you have that are senescent in your bloodstream? We can't, you know, we can't quantify it to that extent, which is a frustrating part of the, the field. Lastly, I'll finish up with two implications for this. So one I already sort of alluded to is that you can measure someone's molecular age, or their physiologic age, if you will, by measuring the burden of senescent cells, and that's undergoing commercialization. There are several companies that are trying to do that for, by a variety of approaches. And secondly, a really important part of this is that one could actually, rather than try and, you know, the paradigm of aging research has been dominated by, for seven years, by pr prevention of aging. You know, if you eat more antioxidants or resveratrol or something, your aging will be slowed. But the idea that one could actually clear senescent cells in an older organism and treat aging is starting to be seriously discussed in, in, in meetings now. And there, there's mammalian evidence for this. So Jan van Dersen made a, a strain of mice where he can ablate the senescent cells in the old animal. And that has many benefit, beneficial effects. And it seems to sort of in some ways revert some aspects of aging. So I think it's a hot, air, hot, hot time for our field and uh, something we'll probably talk about more. Thank you.